Uh, next up, I want to introduce uh, Rob. And Rob is the uh, co-founder and CTP of uh, Resurface Labs. Hey, Rob, can you hear me? I can, loud and clear. Perfect, perfect. I can hear you. I can see you. I think we are good to go. Uh, so today you're going to talk a little bit about the truth about uh, anomaly detection in API security. And uh, without further ado, I'll give you the mic and uh, you can get going. Thank you. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. So again, topic of this talk <clears throat> is the truth about anomaly detection in API security. If you don't know what anomalies are yet, that's okay. Hang in there. We'll, we'll get to that. I am Rob Dickinson. I'm CTO and co-founder at Reservice Labs, and I'm easy to find after this talk at Rob from Boulder on Twitter or Rob at resurface.io for emails. So as far as our agenda today, uh, pretty quick session. Um, leave some time for questions, but we'll define what we typically mean by anomalies in the context of system monitoring and API security tools. We'll talk about how that thinking about anomalies leads to some key API security myths that I'm actually talking about all the time, trying to dispel um, some of these ideas that, that are a little dated. We're gonna back up some of, those, some of those fiery statements that I'm gonna make with some real data. So everything that I'm gonna show here is, is actually based on experimental data that, that we've gathered on our own um, through our own experiences monitoring APIs and, and looking at attackers. And we'll talk very briefly about just some coping strategies um, for how, how to better deal with your, your API security and how to really inform and shape your thinking about API security. This is really exciting. A lot of this is, is new, uh, new content. So, um, so yeah, let's get going. So when we look at the, the bevy of security and monitoring products out there, a lot of folks talk about anomaly detection. And so what do we typically mean when, when we see that in marketing literature or, or technical documentation? You know, what do we mean by anomalies? In most cases, in monitoring and observability, we're talking about statistically rare events. And we really love it when that's true. Um, it really appeals to us, us as mathematicians, even amateur mathematicians, because we know that if the anomalies that we're looking for are statistically rare, then we know that there are some really easy statistical techniques to find those anomalies or discover those outliers really without knowing anything more about them. If you assume that they're statistically rare, they fall on one end of the bell curve or the other end of the bell curve, and you know how to isolate those outliers out. And it, it's, a, it's a way to um, kind of absolve yourself of, of having to include a lot of other details about what's going on. There are cases where that works, um, but, not, but certainly not all the time. One of the cases where that really breaks down that you see almost immediately is that in any real production system, there are always unforeseen events. And by that, I don't just mean things that are statistically rare, but are actually things that the original designers didn't incorporate in their, in their thinking, in their testing. Um, one example of that is new kinds of attacks. There's new categories of attacks being invented all the time. So you design a system, you don't have perfect knowledge of every kind of attack that's out there. So unforeseen events that crop up, again, hopefully <laughs> you're, you're, you're hoping that they show that those unforeseen events are actually statistically in the minority or it means that you're a bad designer, right? Or people really used your system in a way that you didn't, that you didn't um, expect. So again, like so far, everything that we're talking about really clusters around that idea that these things are statistically rare. We really love it in security in cases where the statistical rareness really indicates an attack. Somebody's doing something that is exotic a lot of times there's been a tendency to assume that that's an attack, 
or that's something nefarious. It's certainly not always true. So just because there might be a correlation between statistical probability and whether or not something is an attack or whether something is, is a failure can be a stretch. So at best, that is only as accurate as the assumptions that you can make around the application itself and around your users. Despite all of these things, still, you see a lot of things in marketing literature and technical literature about identifying anomalies, resolving those anomalies. Um, but it always comes back to this core idea. And, and that whole concept is limited by this idea that really those anomalies have to be relatively small sets. If they're not relatively small sets, then the math doesn't really work. You can't really use those statistical techniques to clearly point to indicators or to, to outliers and, and to assign blame. And, and I think what we're seeing, and especially in the data that I'm gonna show you, is that we believe that that anomaly detection in general, this purely statistical approach to identifying problems is actually becoming less useful over time. So to understand why that is, I think we need to go to this, from this level where we're talking about anomaly detection in kind of a philosophical way. Let's hover up now and let's talk about how does that thinking in terms of outliers or anomalies, how does it lead to some of these really classic API security myths that, um, that are holding us back as, as an industry today? So one of those myths is that attackers tend to be outside your secure perimeter. Another one is that attacks are rare and infrequent. But again, if you think about how we're laying this out so far, these would be geographic outliers or statistical outliers. So we're still, we're very much thinking here, even though we're putting this in language that we would use in API security, we're really still thinking about a purely statistical approach where we can point to some subset of the traffic as being outliers and then, and then putting a, a, a higher rating on that. Another example of this is more um, just in the history of how these systems uh, uh, tend to evolve over time. A lot of cases in the, in the, the distant past, you might be attacked and you'd be proud of that because you'd be like, wow, people are really paying attention to what we're doing. Um, people really want what we've got. And so being attacked in, in some ways in the past was almost like a badge of honor or, or an indicator of success. And that is, that is certainly not true anymore. Um, your attackers are not necessarily geographic outliers. Your attackers are not necessarily statistical outliers. And that really, those, those statements discount a lot of then the easy statistical approaches that we can find or that we could apply before to finding in attackers. It is not simply as easy as it used to be. So to help illustrate that a, a little bit better, one of the most classic myths in security today is the idea that ultimately you can draw any kind of boundary that's going to be a completely secure perimeter or a completely safe jurisdiction. Of course, there's something about this as humans that is highly sensible, right? We want to believe that we can build that fence and we can keep the bad folks out. But when you look at these modern systems, it's, it's practically impossible to, to do that perfectly. Um, regardless of how you try to draw that secure perimeter, regardless of how you try to define that safe jurisdiction, the reality is that those attackers are everywhere. Those attackers are inside. Um, inside attacks is one of the largest sources of damage um, in, in corporate America today. That's, and that's something that Gartner, for example, um, identifies as one of the top threats, even for API-driven um, properties. That would also include things like supply chain attacks. Those suppliers are actually in your secure perimeter. 
this also includes geographic jurisdictions. So you might think in the old days, well, we don't really do business with country X, so we'll just block all the traffic from country X, and then any hackers that happen to live there won't be able to get to our digital properties. Well, guess what? Um, in the world that we live in today, those hackers just use compromised machines in the jurisdiction that they are attacking into. And it's relatively easy to do that. So regardless of how you try to draw the secure perimeter, um, again, we're not, I'm not saying that perimeter security is not, uh, is not important as, as something that you need to be thinking about, but you just have to realize that you, you can never quite draw a perimeter in, in such a way that's gonna keep all the bad actors out. The other thing that really pulls at that idea of, of a secure perimeter when it comes to APIs is that typically people are providing APIs because they want those systems to be more open, not more closed within a secure perimeter. Why are you developing and, and making these, these APIs public to begin with? Because you want them to be used by your customers, by your suppliers, by your partners, by other integrators. Those APIs want to be open. And that's very much at odds and in conflict with this idea of, of being able to, to really build a, a perfect secure perimeter. They're just gonna be everywhere. The other really, really big um, security myth that, that I'm actively trying to dispel, and as a developer myself, this really like every day shakes my tree about how I think about developing modern systems in the old days, in most cases, your attackers were statistical outliers. If you looked at sampled web traffic or sampled API traffic by volume, for example, five or 10 years ago, the picture might look something like this. This works great for purely statistical approaches. It even works great for relatively simple machine learning approaches, because basically what you say is we're gonna train the system or we're gonna train the math and most of what's in there is legitimate. And the stuff that kind of falls outside that normal boundary of legitimacy, that's where we're going to find most of our attackers. And that worked OK. What we see now, though, when we look at these modern API first systems that are running on public networks, we actually see that the attack traffic dominates. So when you take that purely statistical approach, you don't find the outliers the way that you did when the picture looked like this. Now, statistically, the, the picture is very different. Also, from the perspective of training any kind of intelligence to, to make sense of this traffic, your attackers, in many cases, are, are going to dominate, especially if you're in financial services, you're something like a crypto processor, you could expect 80% or more of your traffic to actually be malicious in nature. That is something that fundamentally reframes how we as developers and technologists need to think about errors and logging and KPIs and metrics um, because this is, this is really a, a huge shift in the, in the traffic patterns. Now, you could rightfully ask at this point, well, how do you know that? <laughs> how are you able to make some of these um, assertions, especially this one about attack traffic dominating? And it's because we've run experiments that actually provide some data and some context. And so I'm hoping this will help you know, prove some of my points. So to explain how we got this data very quickly, let me tell you just a few words about resurface and what I get to work on all day. Um, Resurface is an API analyst in a box. Resurface is a system that captures API calls from networks, gateways, microservices. We create a data lake out of all those API calls. We continuously scan that data for security and quality problems. And that lets us do things and our customers do things like retroactive searching for zero day threats and failures and easily being able to create new kinds of signatures and new kinds of alerting conditions for really any kind of user or data 
or application behavior that you want to trap on. And best thing of all, this thing never gets sleepy, never takes a sick day, you know, helps your human analysts get more value out of the system. So to give some of the data that I'm showing in this talk, what we've done is we've developed some simple honeypot applications, just simple API you know, based, based applications. We've taken those apps and we've deployed them into a number of different cloud environments. Things like AWS and Azure and Heroku and GCP and so on. When we deploy one of these honeypots then, we deploy resurface with it and we're gonna capture all the API traffic that, um, that, that those honeypot applications are actually serving. So that gives us a full record because again, that's, that's the goal with resurface. That gives us a full record, full audit trail, full data lake of all the API traffic with all the requests and responses. So we know exactly how those honeypot apps are being used and exactly um, what the responses are back from, from those applications. Now in this case, there's no real users here. These are just fake applications that we put out to, to, get, to be able to get some data and to see how these attackers show up. And that's important here. So in the data that I'm gonna show you, there were no real users, there were no ads, there were no inbound links from any other web-based properties. There were no other ways for these attackers to actually find these honeypot applications other than what they normally do, which is they know the IP address ranges for these public cloud environments. And so these folks are scanning those IP ranges all the time. It, it's really as simple as that, right? But we didn't do anything on our side to actually drive any activity to those honeypot applications because that would skew the experiment. You know, we wanted to be able to say everybody that shows up here is, is either basically a spider or a bot or, or an attacker, but we didn't ask anyone to come here. We're simply going to put these applications up into the cloud and we're going to see who shows up to, to try to break in. And again, because we're capturing all that API traffic, this gives us really good data around being able to measure exactly what's going on, profile those, those patterns, and score that data in different ways. This is what it actually looks like visually through our console. We're literally recording all of those API calls, and then we can break those, those calls down into really any kind of histogram or any kind of analysis um, that, that we want to do. To, to really be able to understand all the different kinds of attacks that, that we're seeing. And so by the numbers, so this is across all the different honeypot applications that, and all the different cloud environments that we tried, um, by the numbers, um, how many of our honeypot apps were attacked? I mean, all of them, right? I mean, literally all of them. We've never figured out a way to deploy an application that you aren't almost immediately seeing attackers show up. And again, I, I really believe that's because we're deploying these applications into public environments. But think about that, right? Think about that in terms of the myth of there being a secure perimeter or the myth of obscurity about where your APIs actually live. So even if you're saying, well, my API is only used for this one purpose and it's really only supposed to be used by this one internal group of users. Because you deploy that, that API on Amazon or on Azure, you are making that API discoverable to anyone on the planet that can scan those, those network ranges. How long does that take? Typically, less than 30 minutes once that, once that endpoint has been deployed. So really not very long. We're not talking about you know, it taking months and years to build a successful business, and then someone notices, and then you draw an attack, like the, like the way it used to be. This is when, when, the, when the endpoint becomes live, you can pretty much start your, start your stopwatch and, and within 30 minutes or so, you'll see attackers that show up. Those attackers will continue night and day as long as that digital endpoint is available. 
So we've seen on average about an, an average of about 154 attacks per day per endpoint. And these attacks that we're talking about, the most frequent kinds are application level attacks. So these are attacking the API based on what the web containers that are, that are typically implementing those APIs, um, things that, that those web containers are typically vulnerable to. So some of these are AP, very, very much API specific um, things like um, you know, user authentication smuggling or cookie smuggling, but a lot of these also are just very classic uh, web level attacks. Some of these, um, some of these results, when we actually got into scoring the data and really looking at what was happening, um, surprised even us in running these own experiments. Um, and here's just one great quick example. So we expected a bunch of those bots and errors to, to you know, to, to generate client side errors. Um, we knew that a bunch of attacks would be completed because we're not really doing anything to, to, to actively block those attackers. But we were shocked. This is one of the applications that we deployed. We actually had no idea that the application itself had this redirection behavior that you could trigger. And it was actually attackers. It was through this kind of analysis that we even realized that we were vulnerable. Um, this, this particular set of applications was actually vulnerable to that kind of attack. Um, so even for us, for folks that we look at this all the time, um, it is it is amazing the variety, the um, and the the creativity that that go into these these application level attacks. So wrapping this up, API security in the modern world really requires shifting our thought about some of these assumptions. And again, a lot of these assumptions are rooted in those old school statistical techniques. And, and those ideas that we could just look for anomalies or look for outliers without having to understand the, the greater context of what's really going on. So if you're thinking that those attackers are mostly inside, unfortunately they aren't. You, you need to take a closer look at your insiders, your customers, your suppliers, everyone that you're inviting to use those APIs. And if you're in a public network, anyone else is gonna show up to, to hack at those digital properties. Do not expect attacks to be rare or infrequent. Expect them to happen. Expect them to be common. Expect them to be continuous. Not when you reach some level of popularity, but right away, as soon as those systems are available. You cannot count on attackers being geographic outliers anymore. Attackers can originate from anywhere. And you cannot, you cannot make the direct correlation between being a statistical outlier and an attacker. When in environments where the attack traffic dominates, which is starting to be more and more and more of them, those attackers are skewing everything that we thought that we knew about metrics, about logs. Every time you see a 500 error, now you have to wonder, did that come from an attacker or was that a real user and a revenue loss associated with it? API observability is really the key to moving forward under these conditions. And with the right kind of observability and the right kind of data, you really can move from a place where you know it's not, it's not gonna end well to a place where yes, those attackers are constantly banging in on you trying to get in, but really you have good, very good ways of, of understanding and mitigating what they're actually doing. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Rob. Uh, but I, uh, eye-opening uh, presentation for all of us to take security more seriously and especially API security. Uh, so everybody, uh, please check out Resurface Labs and uh, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. And I hope that you have a, a good rest of your day. Thanks for having me.